like a beacon rising up in the heart of the city, lifting spirits, serving their aspirations, and bringing reality to their ideals. A beacon made brighter by gathering together many sources of light, a series of small universities, individual colleges, each with its own special character and academic emphasis that combined guide our path forward. Avoiding the usual barriers between graduate and undergraduate students, fostering interdisciplinary studies and tearing down departmental walls, championing connection and collaboration. Imagine that, an edge that isn't. We didn't begin as an undergraduate college, then develop professional schools but started with graduate teaching and research in the beginning, laying the roof first. So we could attract top scholars and researchers right from the start. And you know what? They came. Among its purposes, the university champions the finest scholarship of the past and seeks through research the knowledge to guide our steps into the future. Guided and inspired by our founders, we're a university founded on the edge and we continue to thrive on the edge of tomorrow. Good evening. I'm Pradeep Khosla, Chancellor of UC San Diego, and welcome to our evening of non-conventional wisdom. One of the things that makes UC San Diego so unique is our very interdisciplinary approach. Our world-renowned faculty and researchers, they collaborate across disciplines to find solutions to very complex problems. And this is especially evident in our work on climate change. In fact, the modern era of climate change research started here at UC San Diego and more than half a century ago at our Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Today, cross-campus collaboration is driving research and innovation in climate science across a broad range of disciplines and departments at UC San Diego. Our panelists this evening bring expertise from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Jacobs School of Engineering, UC San Diego Health, the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and the Division of Social Sciences. It is this type of collaboration that enables our faculty and our researchers to develop resilient solutions that address the short and long-term impacts of climate change. It is this type of collaboration that contributes to Scripps' reputation as the foremost environmental research institution addressing the most complex environmental issues of our time. At the helm of this impressive interdisciplinary effort is the equally impressive Vice Chancellor, Dr. Margaret Leinen. And Margaret serves as the Director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, the Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences, and the Dean of the School of Marine Sciences. She's an award-winning oceanographer and a distinguished national and international leader in ocean science, global climate, and environmental issues. Margaret also serves on the executive planning group of the UN, of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Throughout her career, she has influenced some of the most consequential programs in climate science in the world. So it's a great honor for me to introduce my colleague, my friend, and one of the leaders at UC San Diego, Dr. Margaret Leinen, who is the host of our event. Let's get started. We're here at the uh, tip of the Scripps Pier at UC San Diego. The occasion is the 60th anniversary of the start of the Mauna Loa carbon dioxide record this was a record begun by my father in 1958, tracking the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a place that my father actually used to test methods that he later used at Mauna Loa. First step is taking an air sample, and this is a glass flask that's been evacuated, and you take it out to a place where you have a clean shot of air, and you simply open this thing up, and the air rushes in here, and you capture a sample. And then you take this back to the lab and you analyze how much carbon dioxide is in it. This is the original lab that my father did the carbon dioxide measurements in. And this device here is called a manometer. The manometer helps you measure the amount of carbon dioxide in air. It's why we know that the carbon dioxide levels were much lower at 315 parts per million back in 1958. After the flasks 
are brought back into the lab. They're mounted here where they're analyzed for carbon dioxide concentration by sending the air sequentially, one flask at a time, through an analyzer. When the analysis is done, we then mount them here where the air is pumped away, the carbon dioxide is retained in these little glass tubes where it's subsequently measured for its isotopic composition. That helps us decide whether the carbon dioxide, say, came from a car, or it came from a plant, or it came from the oceans. When my father started these measurements, 1958, 60 years ago, the concentration levels in the atmosphere were around 315 parts per million. Today, 2018, we're up essentially approaching 410 parts per million. Why? Well, we keep burning fossil fuels, the carbon dioxide keeps building up in the air. It's essentially that simple. Thank you, Chancellor Kosla, and thanks to Ralph Keeling for that video as well. You know, I'm always fascinated by the Keeling curve and what it shows us about our impact on climate. The past 60 years have seen the emergence and now the acceleration of climate change. Now we experience its impacts every day. Those impacts go far beyond warming and warming impacts. They include changes in the amount and pattern of rainfall, the very nature of storms. All of those affect floods, drought, agriculture, the climate impacts include sea level rise and changes in the ocean. Climate change affects public health, transportation, energy, economics, recreation, community impacts, social inequity. Climate change affects virtually every aspect of our lives. That's why I think that it gives the wrong impression to think about it in any individual way. You know, we used to see pictures of polar bears on ice floes uh, as though they were the only victims of climate change. But we're also victims, and that's why we have an imperative to understand what is happening and to look for sustainable solutions. There are also intersections between all these areas that require an interdisciplinary approach to gather the kind of scientific insights that lead to action. Sustainable solutions must be informed by a multinational, multifaceted approach. Policy, education, innovation, and technology all have critical roles to play, as do local governments, experts, academia, and industry. UC San Diego has been at the vanguard of climate science. Going back to when Roger Revell, a former director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the 1950s, published a now famous paper. Before that time, scientists thought that all the CO2 we were putting into the atmosphere would be taken up by the ocean. Roger Revell's paper shows that that wasn't true and that we would therefore experience increases of CO2 in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect. He said, thus, human beings are now carrying out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past, nor be reproduced in the future. So Roger recruited Charles David Keeling to join the faculty to measure CO2. Keeling's discovery of a way to continuously measure levels of CO2 in the air and the resulting Keeling curve utterly transformed our ability to understand climate change. That's why the Keeling Curve has become an icon of climate change. UC San Diego has been pushing the edge of science and everything else related to climate ever since. I'm pleased to introduce our moderators for tonight's discussion, Mackenzie Elmer and Ben Bergen. Many of you know that Mackenzie is a science, environment, and energy reporter at the compelling and award-winning nonprofit news organization, Voice of San Diego. Mackenzie is also a proud alum, graduated from the Scripps Climate Science and Policy Masters of Advanced Studies program. 
Ben Bergen is a cognitive science professor and director of the Climate Action Lab, where he joins other social scientists applying research to understand what leads people to change their minds and their actions uh, regarding climate issues. Mackenzie, Ben, welcome to this evening of unconventional wisdom. We have no shortage of topics we could cover here this evening, but because climate change is broad in its impacts and implications, it can be hard for people to understand where to start. So let's start right here at the local level. Mackenzie, through your report, reporting, what have you found climate change means for the San Diego community? Thank you, Margaret. Um, Yes, I often call myself a catastrophes reporter <laughs> when you think about climate change. Um, and I get to go on the ground in San Diego that's blessed with this beautiful sunny microclimate, but we all know that it's not spared the effects of fossil fuel burning and, and, and climate change. And so what I've found is the city um, and the county are, are rapidly studying what to do and what kind of plans to make um, to uh, deal with things like sea level rise that are quickly eroding, uh, our coastal economy, literally eroding away the beaches that people enjoy, and also affecting property on top of our coastal cliffs that we're also well known for. Um, and we're also not spared from wildfires uh, or from the effects of extreme heat that often affect the um, vulnerable and underserved populations in San Diego. So there's a lot uh, to know and a lot to learn, and I get to study that at the local level here. Um, and so I wanted to ask Ben, uh, you know, we know, I get to study a lot about how climate change hurts us and how to prepare for it, but can you tell us how we're going to fix it? Sure, easy. Uh, <laughs> now, thanks for the softball. So th that's the question, right? We're dealing with a human-caused problem, and, and any time you have humans, you have complexity because humans act for lots of idiosyncratic reasons, but they also act in a cultural context, in a social context, in a political context, and changing minds is hard, changing actions is harder. Fortunately, we have science on all these things, right? We have a political science. We have a science of society and science of human judgment and decision making, communication, what, what messages get through to people and lead them to change their minds and to, to change their actions. So, so to me, the really interesting questions are not what is the solution, but what is the set of solutions that together are going to help point us in the right direction so that we have a future that is the one that we want to have. And fortunately tonight, we have experts on lots of different dimensions of this, from the technology to health dimensions to, um, to the historical dimensions of climate change and human adaptation to it. And so maybe that's where we should begin, by talking to our experts. That's right. Today we have four great minds, each with expertise on grappling a different part of this climate problem. And first we have Tariq Benmarnia. His work extends to the understanding of how future extreme heat and drought will hurt underserved populations in San Diego, and examines how changing climate creates a more desirable landscape for harm harmful diseases like West Nile virus. Mark Merrifield is the director of UC San Diego's Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation, and he's a sea level rise expert at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. His research has contributed to the world's understanding of global sea level rise in official reports for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which leads efforts on the Paris Agreement. Mark's work also touches San Diego's local shores. He and the Center for Adaptation have crafted, crafted a one-of-a-kind sea level rise flood risk warning system in Imperial Beach, California's southernmost beach town. Rivera Collazo is an assistant professor uh, on biological, ecological, and human adaptation to climate change in the departments of anthropology and at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Her research focuses on resilience and how people have responded to climatic change in the past. She works with local communities to understand the current and expected impacts of climate change, including threats to coastal heritage. And then finally, David Victor is the Center for Global Transformation Endowed Chair in Innovation and Public Policy at GPS. There are a lot of titles here, so David, you're gonna have to sit by for a moment. Director of UC San Diego Laboratory on International Law and Regulation, and each one is longer than the next, and leads, to the, UC, and leads the UC San Diego Deep Decarbonization Initiative. He is, uh, in addition to all those things, a renowned expert on how regulation affects the operation of major energy markets, and he is the author of Global Warming Gridlock, 
which explains the global lack of diplomatic progress on climate change and explores more effective strategies. So uh, let's get this conversation started by setting things in a broad historical context. Humans have been around on the planet for about 300,000 years. In that time, we have done a lot of things. Uh, one thing that we've done is come to value aspects of the natural world and also value many of the artifacts that we've created, things that have personal and that have cultural value. With climate change, many of those aspects of our human and uh, cultural heritage that we value are threatened. And uh, here, we'll take a look at a video in which Isabel Rivera Collazo describes some of her work in Puerto Rico documenting and looking for solutions to address these threats. There is a saying in Puerto Rico, no es lo mismo llamar al diablo que verlo venir. It's not the same thing to call the devil than to see him come. It reminds me of climate change. It is not the same to talk about climate change as something that will happen in the future, 2050, 2100, or in a place far away with polar bears hanging on to chunks of ice. Climate change is here, and our communities are personally impacted each and every day. We see hurricanes, frequent winter storms, increased summer heat, coastal erosion, droughts, all these are direct evidence of catastrophic change and reveals just how vulnerable we are. As an environmental archaeologist, I have been working towards two goals, to study how the process of climate change is threatening the physical remains of our coastal heritage and to work with local communities using these same heritage sites to talk about our own identity and what can we do to prevent disaster. While individual communities under the burden of colonization and deep poverty can do little to stop that devil that comes, our conversations can empower communities to own their response and prioritize action. Culture and identity are central in the process of finding solutions that are meaningful at local levels, helping preserve the diverse human experience in the process of changing futures. We know the goals are ambitious, but so are we. And anything is possible when we can work together to make things happen. Isabel, with all the risks from climate change, how do we decide what to prioritize in our preservation efforts? Uh, who should be responsible for making these decisions? How do we make sure that the right people have an equitable voice? Thanks, Dan. It's the, it's, as you were uh, explaining a little bit earlier, it's complex. The answer to that question is very complicated because we are people and because societies are very complicated and have many facets. What is important is that we need to make sure that we recognize the different voices and the perspectives um, that they have and the priorities that they have regarding identity. As climate change occurs and as processes continue happening, we are seeing um, an increased number of disasters and catastrophes, which are often linked to human activity itself. Um, but after the disaster, after the disasters happen, after the catastrophes hit our communities, identity, heritage, the, the tangible and, and intangible um, elements of heritage that makes us who we are, are what helps us ground ourselves and recover and redefine where we want to go. If we lose them, if we miss them, it's harder to recover. So in that sense, we need to include the voices of the users and producers of those heritage to define what they want to uh, preserve first, how they want to prioritize action, and what they are the most important elements that need to be included in the discussions and the uh, set of actions that need to be taken. It needs uh, collaborative work between multiple stakeholders so that the, uh, the things and the areas that we prioritize for action include the voices of the local communities, which often, in many cases, especially those that are bearing the burden uh, of, of climate impacts, um, usually don't have as, a, as much a powerful voice as, as other members of communities. Isabel, I was going to ask, 
a follow-up to you, like, how well are we including those voices in, you know, Paris agreements, some of these international uh, policy-making tools that we have? We still have a, lo a long way to go. Um, in general terms, traditional uh, groups, uh, indigenous communities, tribal groups, uh, local communities, or um, traditionally marginalized groups are not included in the voices of uh, large scale, global scale uh, design for mitigation action. Usually those voices are not prioritized because there is a tendency to work on these things from a hierarchical perspective, thinking that we can provide uh, results or provide solutions to the communities. When in many cases, these indigenous local communities um, have solutions, have priorities, and have experience with the processes of climate change. Uh, and we need to figure out ways to include those voices. That is what uh, part of the work that we are doing at Scripps and from the Department of Anthropology in collaboration with the California State. We are working to figure out a way to include the value perspective from local communities at the same level as a higher level or um, more standardized definitions of heritage preservation so that we, given that all of heritage is being impacted or is being threatened by the process of climate change, um, by figuring out a way in which we can um, make these uh, priorities, make these uh, voices more even and more uh, accessible, more um, stronger voices in these governance elements, in these governance circles, we can um, make sure that the process of dec decision making is uh, more just and, and um, equitable. And just a, a very large question, but maybe you can summarize, like, in general, how has humans, our identity and our relationship with nature changed during past climate changes as compared to our present accelerated scenario? Humans are very dynamic. We, our culture is part of nature and nature is part of culture. We cannot separate those two. So our decision making, our subsistence, our decisions regarding where we live, all depends on the conditions of the environment. So as the environments change, we change too. So it's, it's, that is one of the things that is hopeful in the present. We can figure out ways, if we look at the past, what the past shows us is that there are ways in which we can find solutions. It's a matter of using our previous knowledge, which you, learning from what happened before to figure out new strategies to the present and as well as uh, um, valuing what exists already so we can move forward uh, to the, towards the future that we want to create. Isabel, you mentioned uh, just very briefly a sort of indigenous knowledge about how to deal with changes to the climate. I wonder whether you could speak a little bit more about that. Local experiences, local knowledges, um, which include indigeneity, includes really deep time presence of communities in the ground, record processes of changes of environmental relationships between societies and different types of biodiversity conditions and different types of ecosystems. Um, and that record remains in the memory of the people that have lived in these locations for thousands of years often. Um, by including these voices, we can extend the record of the processes of climate and the processes of biodiversity and the ecosystem diversity that exists at, at each location, and also learn about management um, of these ecosystems and of the threats of climate change. We have learned recently, especially regarding wildfires, how indigenous groups here in California know or, or have um, local and indigenous knowledge regarding how to handle, how to manage the forests and the landscapes to mitigate the impacts of wildfires. Um, we, a, a way of moving forward in to face the threats of climate, um, of climate change is to incorporate and um, establish relationships with indigenous and local communities to figure out ways in which solutions of deep time perspective can help us um, mitigate the impacts that we're uh, expecting. And that's a perfect segue into our next topic. Um, indigenous groups are kind of the bastions in leading this sort of environmental justice and equity movement. And for many people, the most compelling threats that, that climate change pose are to human health. 
um, that, that really affect vulnerable populations the most, especially as extreme temperature events, wildfires, flooding get worse, uh, so does the health of the people who are nearby. Um, and again, those sorts of issues usually affect um, people who are already suffering the most from the effects of poverty and pollution anyway. Um, so Tariq, uh, he looks at climate change uh, through that public health lens, and I think we have a, a video about his work. Climate change is one of the greatest public health challenges of this century. It does not happen in a vacuum. Rather, it has synergistic relationship with other modern challenges, such as COVID-19 or structural racism. My work, focusing on understanding how environmental and ecological determinants of health affect population health and equity in a context of climate change and variability, but also what strategies are effective at minimizing such impacts. Drawing from the fields of epidemiology, statistics, and computer science, we investigate how climate-sensitive extreme weather events impact population health and environmental justice. Specifically, we must explore and document subtle mechanisms that help explain why staggering events such as wildfires and hurricanes, or less dramatic but equally impactful events such as extreme heat or cold, are creating a substantial health burden in the US and globally. Understanding and addressing the health impact of climate change is achievable, but only if we acknowledge that it constitutes a social and environmental justice issue that requires us to address structural determinants of health such as access to healthcare, affordable housing, and sustainable urban planning. Tariq, uh, your work takes the hard science of changing weather extremes and applies it to communities already struggling with structural racism, poverty, and pollution. And it's pretty clear that climate change is going to make the situation worse for those populations. So if you had the floor for one minute before the UN, for instance, what would you tell policymakers to do about this? Good evening. <clears throat> so if I had one minute, I would probably insist on explaining that climate change is exacerbating existing problems in our society. And I would insist on explaining that the first priority would be to address the structural determinants that explain why we're not equal. All of the communities locally, like within San Diego, in California, or globally, between the countries, are differentially exposed and differentially impacted. Um, <clears throat> on top of differentially having contributed to this anthropogenic climate change. So I will try to <clears throat> convince this UN audience that addressing like determinants such as access to healthcare universally, uh, affordable housing, which is extremely important when you talk about extreme heat, when you talk about like what happened recently in Texas was a perfect example showing how different dimensions are going to act together when a problem takes place. So I would insist on that. I would insist on <clears throat> addressing this kind of background and structural determinants that explain like staggering health inequalities as we observe due to segregation, due to structural racism, and this historical perspective on that. That's probably what I would insist on. At the same time, I will try to also convince them <clears throat> that there are a lot of um, benefits at understanding what's happening locally. Local data, local evidence, and working with local com like local communities is key to understand what's happening, but also to understand what would be the best and most effective solution to address what we are going to face in any case in the next decades. Just follow up on that and talk about our specific local situation. So what are the specific health impacts that we're able to observe right now that are that are differentially affecting people in our local region that are, that are caused by climate change related weather changes, uh, uh, high risk events, and so on? Yeah, for San Diego, I think we could take two like, very kind of um, uh, speaking examples uh, extreme heat and wildfire smoke. So, first one, extreme heat, it's, it's a good example because, <clears throat> as some of you probably know, Extreme heat is associated with a huge burden, but this is very subtle. This is like very sneaky because it's mostly going to impact populations that are already 
um, sick and already have a lot of comorbidities. And San Diego is a community with a high prevalence of comorbidities such as cardiovascular diseases, respiratory issues, etc. Of course, all of that is, is not going to be helped by the COVID context. So extreme heat is just going to impact these populations that not only have these comorbidities, but also live in neighborhoods with low green spaces, which what we call like micro heat islands. Also these populations that may have low access to healthcare may be exposed to other issues such as traffic-related air pollution, etc. So uh, extreme heat is a big problem. And in the context of climate change, another additional issue, just to explain why this is important to us and what's happening locally, is that we have a change in the flavors of extreme heat. So the type of extreme heat event that we see today, and we're expecting to see more and more in the next few decades, are <clears throat> humid heat waves that may impact populations during the night, which means that everything that we developed in terms of strategy to try to address the health issues associated with extreme heat need to be adapted, need to be changed to, <clears throat> to deal with these new challenges and a change of flavors of extreme heat. And another big challenge is like wildfire smoke. As you know, like we've seen in the last 10 years in California, the biggest wildfires that were recorded. And it's not by chance. So the, the reason for which we see more wildfires and more wildfires that take like that will be catastrophic and huge and that seem to happen in a very specific season is because of climate change and the kind of <clears throat> interaction between this change of precipitation regime that we see in California and some interaction with other factors that are not specifically driven by climate change, such as Santana winds. And wildfire smoke, as you know, could be like very spectacular, but the smoke may last for, for several days, in, like in San Diego, and may lead to a lot, a lot of health issues, including asthma, exacerbation for vulnerable population, or exacerbation of cardiovascular issues. So we see a huge increase in hospitalization and premature deaths during these events. And that's something that we can contribute to prevent. And um, but just, this is just two example to illustrate how in San Diego, vulnerable communities are already impacted by these events and all of these me mechanisms and patterns will be exacerbated in the context of climate change. Uh, Tariq, let me follow up on that. How exactly do we adapt to it? Or how exactly do we, do we mitigate those problems, given that they're differentially affecting San Diegans? So first, <clears throat> we need to understand which communities are impacted and why, because it's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all problem. So we need to understand, for example, if there are some communities like outdoor workers that are impacted, why, and what are the conditions, what are the occupational settings that may <clears throat> explain these like heat strokes uh, for like uh, construction workers for example but at the same time we have some communities elderly people for example living alone in the east of the county for example that just don't have access to air conditioning or even worse have air conditioning as a housing but can't afford to pay the bill so and there are a lot of solutions that we can implement at the individual level by subsidizing access to air conditioning for example for some communities adapting some occupational regulation and also your like land use and urbanization is very very important contributor to how to, we can uh, adapt to the climate change impact by for example greening strategies by <coughs> active transportation all of these issues uh, may <coughs> be beneficial for two reasons just because they may mitigate the direct impact but also address the structural issues for which we have these comorbidities and for which some population are more vulnerable than others I was going to ask David um, if you had anything to say. You work on kind of economies of scale and different innovations, but Tariq talked about subsidizing these problems. You know, how are we going to actually find this, the cash to make the you know make these changes, these huge structural changes that we need to make? Well, the, there are massive changes, um, and you have now a number of governments that are actually in various ways laying out plans to completely reorient their infrastructure. One of the things I think is so interesting about the, both what Tariq has been saying and Isabel has been saying is we have to gr also grapple with the impacts of climate change. We have a tendency to talk a lot about climate change as a matter of controlling emissions. That's true, absolutely. But we now, because of this long history of not controlling emissions, we have a lot of impacts that we're going to have to deal with. And some of them are in our scope to manage. It's not going to be free. 
Um, and some of them are going to be, uh, they are going to challenge some of our, our old notions of, for example, what's the meaning of nature? There's a very strong result from studies of the impacts of climate change that the unmanaged natural ecosystems are going to be hit the hardest. And so we're, we might have to take some of those ecosystems and start managing them more actively. It kind of changes our relationship to nature. And that's the, the kind of scale of the impact that humans are having on the entire planet now. I also wanted to ask a follow-up question. Um, part of being able to adapt to these effects might be being able to predict when they're going to happen. So predicting, predicting heat, pre predicting um, sea level changes. I don't know, uh, Mark, do you have any, any insight into th what that means for innovations, what that means for um, the relationship between scientists and local governments and so on? You're muted. <laughs> We've all been on talking about technology <laughs> while I'm muted there, but um, uh, it, it's our strength. I mean, that's what uh, our the science uh, research that many of us involved in are trying to predict the uh, natural systems, changes in natural systems, and particularly extreme events, which are uh, kind of a uh, because they are so rare and so hard to observe in many ways. Uh, some of the under, our understanding of, of that variability is just starting to come to bear. So I think uh, we are um, we are going to see a real uh, expansion in the way scientists not only pose those problems but how they go about them. Because it's not just a cold answer we're looking for here, but what is a uh, what is the information that a community needs or a uh, sector of society needs, and that's uh, a slightly different way to approach the research problem. And so. I think uh, what we'll see more are these co-production kind of pieces where community and academia will get together to, um, to not only uh, go after the problem, but also to pose the question. Yeah, I think that actually creates a great transition point here because Mark, your work focuses on, at least in part, these collaborations. We've got a video that describes one of them and uh, maybe we can run that now. The seas are rising. We've seen the type of coastal flooding that we've never seen before. This year alone, the southern part of our beach has been closed seven months. I think more and more people here are coming to terms with, well, now we're seeing the climate change. What are some things that we need to do to address it? It's part of a larger effort at UC San Diego, understanding and protecting the planet, which really crosses the campus. We are looking for ways to both understand the climate change and build sustainability and resilience to help protect planet as well. The Resilient Futures Project is an attempt to give advance warning of flood events for Imperial Beach. Imperial Beach is a low-lying community. During the winter, when high waves coincide with high tides, it'll flood. One of the most important things that we really had to deal with was, when is coastal flooding going to happen? And the Resilient Futures Program nailed it. They literally tell us to the date and time, and so we could alert our residents, close off our streets, and prepare for that. For each project that we develop, we build a team of experts. We're working with the city of Imperial Beach. We're bringing together engineers who are specialized in taking LIDAR measurements, and we're working with coastal oceanographers, trying to simulate the wave variability as it's coming towards shore and how it transforms into the run-up. The unique aspect of this project is the ability to bring in the LIDAR observations in a way that gives us unprecedented information during these extreme events. With the drone LIDAR, we'll be able to access places that would be otherwise hard to get to, and which in some ways are the more interesting places because they're very understudied as a result. With the technology, we're able to make really high resolution three-dimensional maps and quantify the amount of erosion. This information is important for the communities to plan better for the future. The Coastal Data Information Program, CDIP, maintains a buoy offshore that gives us a really high, accurate measurement of all the properties of the wave field coming in, which is an important consideration when we're trying to drive these models of coastal flooding. This buoy is fitted with acceleration sensors and with a very sensitive magnetic field sensor. It uses these acceleration sensors to measure how the waves are bouncing it around, and it uses the magnetic field sensor to determine the direction of the waves. It's like a compass picking up on magnetic north. 
The data from this buoy provides accurate wave information and better forecasts to help protect the people that live and work along the coast. We'd like to take this approach and apply it to other types of problems. Communities that are affected by drought, by heat, wanting more information, more detailed information about when these events are happening and why they're happening. We'd like to work with different researchers across UC San Diego to develop similar products and capabilities for communities. It's amazing to have some of the world's greatest scientists work on real world problems with our city. It was a really great application of science to solving a real world problem. So Mark Pizadas, that's a really great example of being able to come up with technological solutions that help us adapt. Uh, what are some other clear cases you mentioned? Uh, you mentioned a few. What are the what's the low hanging fruit here? What, how can we find ways to innovate to help local communities uh, on the short term? Well, it, there's a lot we don't. I mean, for the the flooding problem, um, the the issue of what happens to a beach. Uh, when big waves hit it. It's a sort of a classic problem. It's a very complicated problem. And that shoreline defense is going to be so critical for understanding what sort of adaptation choices we have going forward. So just even the basic research of understanding natural variability and how um, natural systems behave under extreme uh, conditions is, uh, as you say, low-hanging fruit. I think there's uh, some basic questions that Surprisingly, we don't know the answer to. Like, we know the ocean's warming. There are a lot more heat waves that we're seeing, uh, even on, right off the pier in San Diego. We don't know what that means in terms of the local um, local environment. What how, does that lead to more terrestrial heat waves? Does that lead to more humidity at night? And we had better figure that out because the ocean's going to get a lot warmer going forward. So there's a lot of um, basic science questions that I think uh, are ripe, and we have quite a team of graduate students and postdocs who are uh, kind of going at this from all different directions. You saw we had a lot of toys in the video. Uh, I think that uh, technology is sort of at the forefront here. We need new ways of doing things. We, we're basing a lot of our assessment of climate change on systems that were developed last century and even two centuries ago. We're talking about tide gauges. Those were built to you know measure the tide in one location and we relied on them to give us a picture of sea level rise for a century. Uh, now we have satellite systems and uh, in-situ systems that are really giving us a clear and uh, sort of brilliant picture of how the Earth is, um, the natural variability of the Earth as well as how it's changing with, with climate change. So it's an exciting time to be a, an Earth scientist, and I think it's also um, challenging because we don't have a lot of time to sort out these issues. Um, I think one of the things that maybe is not clear from the video is that those waves that hit Imperial Beach, they've been hitting that beach for decades. So you could have been there in 1960 and seen an event like that. The problem is that they're just getting more and more frequent. And uh, I would, the, based on the predictions of what sea level is bound to do over the next uh, couple of decades, we can expect another decade. We won't really see the kind of dramatic flooding events until maybe the 2030s. Problem is, is that once we hit that, depending on our emission choices, we will see a fork in the road where our low emissions will still be in a manageable state and things like these adaptation strategies will still be effective. But the other path is will be uh, business as usual and uh, the acceleration will be dramatic. And from the middle of the century to the end, uh, the number of flooding days will increase almost exponentially till the end of the year, every high tide may be a flood event in parts of San Diego. So um, we, we have a short little window here to sort out how to be, build a more resilient future, as well as to um, really the crux or the most important part of adaptation is to make sure that we are doing everything we can on the mitigation side uh, so that the adaptation challenge is not insurmountable. Mark, you work in a unique intersection of uh, the community and the, the like political community and the scientific community. And there's something I learned how to talk about at Scripps when I was studying there, you know, scientific uncertainty. And a lot of the, 
like severity of the catastrophe before us depends on like a lot of choices we have to make in this uncertainty. So how do you translate that to a politician or someone working on th these decision makers, like the severity of the problem and, and how do you push them towards realizing what needs to be done in that time? As well, there's a whole language of surrounding risk that we are getting familiar with. And uh, we have our own ways of measuring uncertainty. But really what we're trying to do is give people a sense of what the risk is going forward, how certain is our assessment of that, and then from there build strategies. And so I think um, uh, an important part of our uh, approach is to really um, address those uncertainties directly and to translate that into risk. It's, um, it's a challenge because um, that's a hard notion to convey. And uh, but I think it's, I, I think you're quite right that that's right at the core of how you convey um, actionable science. Just going to say in, in San Diego, at least, there's so much property along the coast, as you know, and there's a big contention between, you know, at what point will we have to perhaps move back? Um, and so it's just, you know, how do you translate that concept that eventually these structural changes will need to be made? at a time when people can't really see quite yet that it's impending, but yeah. I think one, um, one aspect of, the, of this that is perhaps unique in the way people think about um, these sorts of challenges is, for instance, the COVID challenge. We're weathering the storm. We're, we'll get through this. We'll return to some sense of normalcy. With the climate problem, that's not the case. Every day, normalcy is slipping away. We've we will not return to a low six sea level state. We will not return to a cooler earth. These are all just uh, situations that we're gonna have to deal with going forward. And every day that we delay in dealing with it, um, the warmer, the higher, the more frequent it will be. And so um, the question of when you move away from the shoreline, that will, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think science has to be the, the uh, uh, messenger there. I think that will be almost obvious. And um, we can try to give some projections about when that might be a concern, but um, the shoreline is going to change dramatically in the century. Okay. Well, that sort of leads us into our next section to talk about policy. Um, we're going to focus squarely on what's coming next and how to get to a stable and healthy future. So the science, as Mark said, is pretty clear that we have to do a lot of things to get there, but what are we supposed to tackle first and how are we gonna get it done? So David Victor runs a deep decarbonization initiative and focuses on innovative financial and engineering solutions to climate change. And we have a video about some of his work next. As a political scientist who works at the intersection of politics, engineering, and climate science, I study how societies are going to make huge transformations needed to eliminate the emissions of the gases that cause global warming. We call that deep decarbonization because the most important of these gases is carbon dioxide, most of which comes from burning fossil fuels. It can seem easy to come up with clever schemes for solving climate change through more renewable power like solar and wind, or maybe more nuclear, or new kinds of power plants that capture pollution before it goes into the atmosphere. The engineering is certainly very interesting. Serious solutions, however, must be anchored in political realities. They require a multifaceted approach that looks at the intersections between the engineering, the science, the impacts of climate change, and the policies that we as humans are willing to pay for. Many of our choices also depend on what we think others will do. Should Europe invest heavily in cutting its own emissions, for example, if the United States doesn't do the same? What should we do about China? It is this multifaceted approach that makes our conversation about climate change so interesting and unique. Leadership and action start with all of us, our communities, researchers, and innovators. Policy often has a role to play, but quite often policy is catching up to the facts on the ground that we create. That's how the global and global warming will get addressed. David, we just saw a massive shift in US leadership on climate change. What are the political re realities, as you mentioned in your video, that we now face in pushing the economy in a direction that slows the rate of global warming? Well, it's auspicious. Uh, there's clearly been a big shift, and this 
current Biden administration has a focus on climate in a way that no administration in American history ever has. And as everyone's seen in the reporting, they also face a very difficult uh, political environment. The nation is still divided to some degree on these issues. Um, and even within the Democratic Party, where they have a you know, barely working uh, margin in, in both, both houses, you have to find policies that are acceptable to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and to Joe Manchin, the senator from, from West Virginia, which is a coal state. And putting that together is, is difficult. To me, what's interesting is that every major country is now going through the same thing. Europe is grappling with its own uh, uh, political contestation around uh, climate change, coming to slightly different answers, more aggressive policy. India, uh, a huge democracy, is also grappling with this issue. China uh, is grappling in different ways. And so they're all coming up with different answers. And if each country is left to its own devices, it's, they're, they're going to do quite a lot on climate change, but not enough to really stop warming. And so that's now the key challenge for the Biden administration, is they have to offer a package that is seen to the rest of the world as credible, so then the rest of the world is willing to do more than they would otherwise, and we start to begin to have cooperation as opposed to just a lot of talking about this issue diplomatically. David, policy often follows popular will. I guess that's more true in democracies than in other political systems, although maybe not entirely. Uh, but how do, you, how do you get people to change their minds when, as you say, mm -hmm. climate is an extremely divisive political issue? What, what, what policy changes are in the sweet spot that you could both, they could both be useful, immediately impactful, but then also not be politically objectionable? Yeah, so that's a hard question to answer with magic beans, because that's one of the reasons why we've spent a lot of time talking about this issue and not actually getting very much uh, done about it. I, I do think one of the things we teach in the first year class, master's level class about public policy is a theory called the logic of political survival that explains why not only do democratic leaders pay attention to what the public wants, but also autocratic leaders in different ways pay attention to what the public wants because they have to hold on to hold on to political power. And that's what you see happening right now is, is leaders grappling with the reality that some of these policy changes are going to be costly. The impacts we're now starting to see, as Mark just laid out, are going to be costly as well. And so they've got to put together packages of policies. The one thing that I've learned studying this topic over the last few decades is that all that is easier when the costs of change are lower. And so that's why I think technological change is a big part of the politics and why this deep decarbonization initiative that I co-lead with the professor George Tynan in engineering is a joint venture between policy school and the engineering school and also anchored at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography because you've got to put together these different packages of, of, of policy solutions and in particular drive down the cost of change doesn't make the political problems trivial, but it makes them a whole lot easier when change is, is less expensive and when there are interest groups that then benefit from change and they want to reinforce that politically. Isabel, I wanted to ask you, if, if you don't mind, um, in what ways do, does policy get in the way of, of the kinds of changes that you think need to take place in this climate problem? We have to remember that um, vulnerabilities are not even throughout uh, the planet and especially not within individual uh, countries. So in many cases, policy, when it ignores the local voices and it ignores the um, differential groups within individual communities or individual societies, it ends up trying to, um, the policy ends up ignoring or setting, um, ignoring the diversity of cultures that characterize each society. So in many cases, policy, when it's not fine-tuned to these um, priorities of local communities, it can end, end up uh, affecting the longevity and the diversity of cultural um, expressions that characterize humanity. So for example, many of the uh, societies that are carrying the burden of climate change are not the ones that are uh, high, the highest emitters of, of uh, of uh, greenhouse gases. Um, when we are talking earlier about um, relocating communities, archaeology shows that communities do not reloc relocate easily. Um, they live for a long time in the same location. And unless the risks are perceived at a local level, unless it affects the priorities of the local community, change is not going to occur. So priorities and po on poli policy that ignores local priorities is going to end up um, um, unif um, 
disintegrating this diversity and this richness of culture and richness of deep time knowledge that sometimes resides in these local communities that are not necessarily central or might not occupy the spaces where policy is created. So either or maybe both, we can construct a way in which uh, local communities and this diversity of voices can have a role to play in the creation of the policy and as, at the same level, be able to empower members of these local communities to have a, a same and an equal seat at the table where policies are created so that the priorities of their communities can be taken into account when the decisions are made, uh, such as modifying or in, introducing technological changes to local uh, to different localities or relocating communities. David, and actually this is a question for the whole panel if others want to chime in afterwards. Um, so climate research itself is intrinsically political and uh, yet it has to be funded in order to happen. I wonder whether you could speak a little bit to the complexities surrounding that. Who is funding climate research and what are the, what are the political considerations for different sources of funding? Yeah, and, and some of the research is very expensive, although I can say our work doesn't have as many cool toys as Mark's work, so we've got to get our more toys <laughs> for us. Um, I think this is a question that universities have grappled with in all domains of research. Climate work is very political uh, or has political implications. So does work on genetic engineering, a lot of other topics. You've got to do all the right things in a university setting that is aimed at the public pur pur purpose to the firewall between the sources of funding and the actual independence of the research. You have to disclose, and I think you have to have a diversity of sources. In, in the case of the work that I do, we have funding from uh, uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, including those that, that do research on the electric power sector. We have funding from the University of California system. We have funding from philanthropy. Philanthropy has been unbelievably important because every once in a while you want to go do something that just seems kind of nutty but could be transformative. So over the last 18 months at Scripps, we have uh, gone off and built a research program that's looking at questions around how quickly could we respond in an emergency to actually suck the carbon dioxide that the Keeling curve has been measuring going up to suck some of that out of the atmosphere along with cutting, uh, reducing emissions in response to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to extreme impacts of climate change. I think when we first started that work, you know, it was kind of wartime footing deployment of machines, people thought we were a little, little nuts. Um, and with philanthropic support, we could go off and build the models and show exactly what's feasible. And I think that's what you have to do here. I, and I guess one last thing I'd say is all work of this type has to grapple with attention, attention between being completely independent and being relevant. And for someone who studies how industries actually cut emissions, I have found it enormously valuable to be talking to the industries and talking to the firms um, and understanding what they can do and what they can't do, because otherwise you end up with kind of abstract models about the future that are not connected to real costs, real opportunities, and, it, and you lose insight into how quickly the society can transform itself to make big reductions in emissions. Yeah, we had a project in, uh... San Diego Bay, to kind of similar to what we were doing in Imperial Beach, look at flooding and causes of flooding. And because of the bays, um, you know, the, the people surrounding the bay, the airport, the uh, port authority, the utilities, uh, the military were all involved in that project. And it led to some spinoff projects with uh, utilities to look at how um, sea level rise might impact, particularly things that are buried along the coast, which are pretty vulnerable to groundwater rise. That, um, that has been a very interesting uh, partnership and very productive. I think it also raised some concerns around campus that uh, about the optics of that, about climate center working in that particular direction. I think it's uh, been a very healthy conversation. I, th I think transparency is the key issue here. Uh, I think we need to be um, very upfront about what we're doing and why and um, it is the voices of the next generation of scholars coming forward who are really the most challenging on this front. I mean, I think they are asking the questions of who's funding what we're doing and why. And I, I think that's a very valuable conversation. Yeah, Tariq. Yeah, just, just to add on what <clears throat> Mark and David just said about the funding, because I think one important aspect is 
even if I think this is very important to be transparent and to mention and to contextualize uh, climate change and climate viability, I think a lot of issues and a lot of solutions would exist without counterfactually climate change. Because, and I think COVID was the situation of COVID-19 that we, we faced, we're facing and we're going to face, to face is a good, very good example showing that it's not a coincidence that uh, the same population has systemic, systematic impact, that the same profile of patients we see in, with, during a heat, like extreme heat event during wildfire or when there is a peak of cases of COVID-19. So a lot of solutions and issues we can address independently of like what climate change is kind of exacerbating. And I think this is what we went through in the last few years, you know, with the previous administration, we had to be very kind of innovative in a way to put things together. But I think um, climate change, even if it's extremely important, is a context that may exacerbate uh, existing issues, existing problems, or bring sorry, like <clears throat> uh, problems that are existing elsewhere, which means that may we may have existing solutions that we can try to experiment and capitalize on, as Isabel was mentioning before as well. In, in the case of archaeology and funding, we are facing a challenge that is um, that social sciences and specifically anthropology and archaeology still need to uh, engage more effectively in the topic of climate change. So the, re the type of research that my research lab is doing, it's at the border of, at the edge of the redefinition of practice. So it's challenging to actually find traditional sources of funding. We have to be creative um, to, to be able to, to find the type of support that needs, that is required. Another challenge is that climate change, the impacts that we are uh, experiencing are happening so quickly, so fast, that the heritage that we are trying to uh, protect and document is just washing away with every wave. Um, and in the funding processes, the traditional funding processes, usually people might think that, that you submit a grant and next month you have the, the, the funding, but it doesn't work like that. You have to design the project, submit the proposal, and then wait for about a year to get the results and you might need to resubmit. So it, it can be a cycle of one to three years in order to get funded. By that time, the coasts have changed so much. The landscapes have uh, washed away or there have been wildfires and have burned the, um, the, the, the heritage sites that we want to protect. So there are two challenges. We as archeologists, as anthropologists, as heritage professionals, we have to make ourselves more relevant and engage in the questions that require, that are needed in order to be able to tackle the questions that the communities and the society in general from policy level, from governmental levels to community leaders, the type of questions that they need answered from the past. So we need to improve our science as, as, as archaeologists and anthropologists. But also, we are looking for a change in the funding process so that we can respond urgently. We need to respond quickly because these sites are washing away and we need to speed the process of decision making and intervention and deciding what needs to be protected, how and, and who is going to take care of that. Great. Well, maybe we'll open up the discussion in a last round here and talk about um, talk about what gives us hope. Uh, so obviously we've we've heard some pretty dismal descriptions of the future here. Uh, we want to envision a future that's different from the worst case scenario. And the fact that you are all working in this area and don't seem uh, completely uh, overwhelmed by the prospects makes me think that there must be scientific reasons why you think that there's hope, and maybe even personal reasons why you think there's hope. And so I thought maybe we'd talk a little bit about, about that now. What, what is it that you believe we can and should be doing to both, as you said, Mark, to both mitigate uh, and adapt? I mean, I can, I can speak personally for myself. I, I find that there are, there's a, there's a moment available here for reflection and for trying to understand what our individual role is in this ecosystem. You know, we are people who make individual decisions. Uh, I make decisions about what kind of research I do, what kind of service I do, what my, how I move around in the world, transportation, housing. And, you know, you can start to evaluate and assess your impact. There are lots of calculators you can use online to assess your carbon footprint. If that's, if that's a, a place where you can make progress, 
There's the flying less movement, which is very applicable to academics. The idea that um, that large conferences might not need to attract 10,000 neuroscientists to Louisiana every year. That maybe there are lower impact ways to do that. And you know, on a personal note, I've I've spent the last five years and haven't flied, ha haven't haven't taken a flight to a conference. Um, and that's worked out okay for me. I'm relatively senior. I understand it's different for people at different career stages. But you know, you can find out what are the what are the ways to minimize your minimize your own impact. And and to me, having that moment of reflection has been extremely um, extremely helpful for better understanding what I want my life in the world to be like. You know, I don't. I'm not a friendly person when I'm driving on the road. And it's really nice to not have to commute by car if you can manage to find another way to get to campus. Uh, you know, you get your work day starts earlier if you're on the shuttle, for example, than it does if you're behind the wheel. You can spend more time with your kids. Th there, are, there are lots of ways that uh, reflecting on why you do the things that you do and what the total cost, not just the uh, financial cost, is of your actions can really, really change uh, change, change how you assess the value of the things that you do in your life and, and make, you, uh, make you able to gain more appreciation for the choices that you have and how to live. So that's, that's something that gives me hope, that people are able to make different choices and that sometimes those choices actually benefit them in ways that they never anticipated. Uh, I don't know if the other, if, if you, you wanted to chime in or if you want to have the panelists chime in first. Oh. Panelists, what do you have to say? David. Um, Reflection is important. It's always important to agree. Um, I see hope in two places, at least two places. And, and in both these places, the changes are truly profound. One is the overall global emissions picture is not great, but that's to be expected because the entire world's energy system is going to change you know, relatively slowly. But when you look in, if you zero in and you look at the revolutions that are taking place in, in, in industry, in agriculture and in the energy system in particular. But the revolutions are truly amazing. Rapid reduction in costs of uh, many of the mitigation technologies, not just wind and solar, but wind and solar are a big part of it. Fortuitously, the most advanced, the, the most rapid advances we're seeing technologically relate to the electric power sector. Very important because an economy that decarbonizes is an economy that's probably gonna electrify as many sources as, po as many uses and energy uses as possible and then decarbonize, reduce emissions from the electric power system. And we're actually making a lot of progress, even without climate policy across the federal level in the United States. So that's one area where I see just actually a lot of hope because it just it makes the politics easier as the technology advances. The other area I see a lot of hope is, is with the financial markets. Um, in just a year, and certainly in five years, the awareness of both the, the, the risks to companies that don't cut emissions and the physical risks of climate change, the awareness has just skyrocketed. And massive quantities of, of capital are now paying attention to that. And the more we get the allocation of capital attentive to the problem, the more we get infrastructure right, the more we get uh, corporate planning decisions right, and the more the concerns about climate change get baked into the way people are making decisions and ultimately allocating capital, it's so important, in ways that are gonna be harder to reverse, that are gonna be more credible to then the rest of the world that we're starting to address the problem. And so those are two, two places where I see actually quite a lot of progress and, and especially progress in the last year, even progress in the middle of the pandemic, which has been extraordinary. Isabel. Um. We created, after Hurricane Maria, the impact to Puerto Rico was unbelievable. The suffering was just mind-blowing. It, it, there's, there are no words. After, the pro, after Hurricane Maria, we created the Project Dunas, which means Descendants United for Nature Adaptation and Sustainability. And uh, we have been learning a lot from our local communities to, um, to figure out ways to stimulate climate action. Um, as a social scientist, I often interact with uh, natural scientists that work on climate change, and I get the question more often than not of why don't societies listen to us? Why don't they change their behavior? Why don't they listen to us? So through DUNAS, we have been trying to figure out, you know, where is the gap in the communication? Um, we have been working since 2018 with funding of the Wildlife Conservation Society to restore a sand dune 
that got um, that badly impacted during the hurricane. It got washed away it, the, during the erosion to that sand dune, an archeological site got impacted. So we are studying the archeological site to explore and reconstruct the ancestry of these communities that are the lead volunteer leaders with us, while at the same time using a biomimicry system that is very low tech to reconstruct, to help the processes of reconstructing, uh, reconstructing um, the sand dune by stimulating a sand deposition just, just with the wind. Um, and now that the sand dune has been restoring, we are also working on uh, reconstructing the wetland that is behind the sand dune while engaging with the communities. So today, um, what the, our volunteers went today, today right now, um, just looking at my phone, the volunteers, um, went to the location and were planting the, um, the, the vegetation to help the restoration of the wetland. And one of the volunteers said, and I'm reading uh, from her statement, she says, there is a place in the world where I am happy, make doing the, what I enjoy at the most. And at the same time, that, what, that which I consider my, um, my deber, my um, requirement, what I have to do, um, to plant for the future. Each plant or tree that I, that I put in the ground, I grab it between my hands and I place it, I give it back to the earth so that the earth, so that she, the plant, can take care of my earth. It doesn't matter what happens around me, at that moment I breathe and I'm happy. You ask me what makes, what gives me hope? That gives me hope. We're not for this project that we are engaging with local uh, heritage to communicate the impacts of climate change, to see it in reality on the ground, how it is impacting us. We can also, through our work, bring back hope and happiness, even if we can see the impacts of climate change, because we can uh, feel responsible, we can be part of the solution. And being able to be part of that process with my own communities, that's what gives me hope. Yeah, Tariq? No, sure. I just, just about the optimism. I think we have many, many reasons to be optimistic in this context. Just first of all, to wake up in the morning, but also we have some evidence about things that worked. And um, I can just give a, one example, just to illustrate how, yeah, by better understanding, we can make some progress. So for example, in New York City, after a few years of trying to understand <clears throat> like the microheat islands and what was the issue in relation to extreme heat and collaborating with the National Weather Services on the other side and local communities with the um, New York City Department of Health and Mental, and Mental Health. Uh, we found that just after incorporating a lot of information and working with local communities, updating and changing the existing early warning system contributed to prevent more than 50% of the deaths and hospitalization attributable to heat which is like in only two or three years, which is substantial. Just like by incorporating this information and working with local partner, half of the burden associated with extreme heat was prevented, which is substantial. So just showing how we have, we have some reasons to be optimistic. Another aspect that I think is important is that most of, <clears throat> for example, what David was mentioning and all of the strategies that are negotiated have so many co-benefits for so many societal dim dimensions, including po like population health and public health. Uh, for example, we can think about reducing emission from traffic. Uh, the good news is that it's going to reduce emission for air pollutants that are going to reduce the burden associated with these air, po air pollutants like tropospheric ozone, like uh, particle matter, etc. We want to promote active transportation. The good news is that it's going to reduce sedentary behaviors, promote physical activity that will be associated with so many co-benefits. Same thing for diet. Reducing meat consumption is not only a very good strategy to reduce um, greenhouse emissions at the individual level, but also associated with so many health benefits in terms of cardiovascular health, specific type of cancer. So yeah, there are so many, so many good reasons to, to act and so many co-benefits that actually are illustrated in the context of some actions that took place during COVID. We kind of uh, coincidentally, because of the COVID restrictions, we are able to see how far we can go in terms of uh, actions to, for example, in relation to traffic. So that shows that we have a lot of things that could 
allow us to be optimistic. And um, as we say in French, it's uh, it's better to be, it's a kind of a quasi translation, but as we say that it's better to be optimistic all the time and be wrong times to times than being pessimistic and being right all the time. And I think this is, uh, this is what motivates all of us, I guess. That's great. Mark. You're muted again, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to hear from you. With, <laughs> wholeheartedly with Tariq. I, I, you know, we know, we know what the problem is. We've identified the issues. We know what the solution is. It's going to be very hard. But there are so many positive outcomes that are going to come through that solution. It's going to be a better, more resilient, safer, healthier society. Um, I think ultimately that will win the day. What also gives me hope is calling uh, a world expert like David Victor first thing in the morning on a climate issue and seeing him surfing, uh, coming out of the water, uh, answering the phone, doing all his business in the car. Uh, to me, I don't know why, but that just gave me a lot of hope, David. I, I, uh, <laughs> I thank you for that. It was my joy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, uh, Mackenzie, you haven't had a turn yet. <laughs> what gives me hope? <laughs> Um, what gives me hope is that governments are paying attention and are f sort of sometimes being forced to pay attention, but um, it's just, it's good to know that we have the decision makers, um, no matter what side of the aisle you are on, at least in California, um, are sort of forced by the, the changing of the earth to pay attention to these issues and start planning for the future, and I get to see that in real time by making sure that they're doing that <laughs> and checking in on, on their policies and planning, and a lot of which have um, these panelists have worked on personally here in San Diego. And so it's nice to see, especially what Mark had said earlier about um, he thinks the future is scientists working more closely with communities on s tackling specific problems. I think that also gives me hope that these two sometimes perhaps divided areas um, are now coming together and working on, on this problem that we all face. Margaret, you're not going to get off. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, there are two things that give me enormous hope. One is the, the great diversity and innovation that is being applied to this vexing problem. Uh, everything from uh, deep science to uh, policy to um, communication to art uh, everywhere you look, people are innovating around solutions and communicating about this. And that is enormously uh, hopeful to me. The second thing is the new generation. UCSD students are absolutely committed to seeing progress on this climate problem because it's their world. And UC San Diego also has incredible outreach to uh, K through 12 schools in San Diego. And I see that in, in students as young as uh, you know, first and second grade and in high school, it's their world. And they're not going to let it go uh, without a fight. And we see that in uh, in the students at UCSD, we see it in K through 12. We see it everywhere we go in uh, programs around the country. And these new voices are really going to hold us accountable and they're going to hold politicians accountable. And our students vote and the others will soon be voting. And I think that that will be an ineluctable force that starts working on policymakers as well. And that gives me enormous hope. So we barely scratched the surface of what UC San Diego faculty, research, and students do. You heard each of our experts talk about people in other fields that are all very important to their results. So they're trying to not only understand climate change, uncover its impacts on our lives, our livelihoods, on our planet, but they're developing solutions for sustainability and developing new ideas for policy for the future. So thank you to each of our guest experts for sharing your insights with us this evening. Your work and your clear passion and tangible examples 
of what happens when we understand that we all have something to contribute are incredibly important. Thank you for your leadership and your commitment to addressing this critically important issue for our future. So Chancellor Kosla, over to you. Thank you, Margaret. And all I can say is, wow. I don't know about you all, uh, but I was completely mesmerized as I was listening to this great conversation. And I think what gives me hope personally is that I have colleagues like you, Margaret, Mackenzie, Ben, Isabel, David, Tariq, Mark, uh, and you just represent some of our 2,000 colleagues. So we have amazing faculty doing amazing work. Uh, and I was going to call it groundbreaking work, but I think I'm going to call it climate changing work in a good way, changing climate for the positive in a good way, taking us back to where we need to be. So I'm very hopeful that, that your passion for the work you're doing is going to help us get to where we need to be. Your passion to educate the next generation is going to get us to where we need to be. Uh, and San Diego, UC San Diego is going to be at the top of this game. I'm very confident of that. Um, to our viewers, to our listeners, I want to say, you know, we do this every so often. And I hope that you join us uh, for our next evening of non-conventional wisdom. That's what we call it. Uh, it's going to be in May. Uh, and the program this time around is going to be on crossing borders, San Diego's dynamic binational region. And this program will explore the very complex challenges and the opportunities that are unique to our region. So to register and for more information, you should visit the 60th anniversary website. And let me just say thank you, everybody, to my colleagues and to our viewers. Uh, looking forward to see you again. Good night. Bye.